Hi, my name is Michael Andrew, and I'm going to give you a free tutorial on the awesome little Canon M50. If you are an owner of this camera, congratulations, bang for your buck. It is a wonderful little vlogging camera. We got an articulating touchscreen monitor. It's an APS-C sized sensor, so you can do lots of different kinds of shooting, including portraits and landscapes. Just tremendous value with the kit lens 650. So if you are coming from another camera system and you're experienced and you just wanna to jump to the topic, take a look at the table of contents that we've built in the description below. We spent a lot of time making this. This is a long video. Do Command F or Control F for a search, type in the topic and you can jump to that particular subject in, without needing to go through the whole video. For those of you who are beginners and in, in intermediate photographers, I wanna take a moment to tell you and warn you that this video will teach you about how to operate the camera, but the most important tool that you have for photography is right here between your two ears. Your brain is the most important tool by far, and the camera is an extension of whatever you see in your brain. Now, when I got started way back in 2003, we didn't have YouTube, so I had to go out and learn by trial and error, and it took me two years to learn everything just by making mistakes and trying something new. And there was a point that I was so frustrated. I had my camera in, the in my hand and I was looking at this wall that I was getting ready to throw it into. I was so frustrated, I was ready to give up photography. And I know beginning and intermediate students go through this frustration and I just wanna tell you I've been there. I know exactly how you feel and I am here to help you through it. Once I got through the basics and I realized that there was so much to learn, I remember thinking to myself, okay, there were these college classes I could take. There were workshops I could take. They cost thousands of dollars. And so I sat down and I just decided, you know what? I can make a better course that is efficient, fast, cuts to the chase, and is going to save people a tremendous amount of time and frustration in learning their camera. And that's where my crash courses came from. So I'm trying to warn you that the operation of the camera is just one part of the puzzle. It's one part of the pie, so to speak. And to become a good and proficient photographer, there are things you need to know about the physics of the camera, talking about shutter speed and aperture and depth of field, ISO, talking about the art, composition. There are some digital basics you'll need to know about the camera. We need to know about lighting, including operating a flash, that's in addition to the camera. And then we have the different philosophies and mindsets for different kinds of shootings. There's, there's even workflow. So looking at portraits, that's one type of mindset. And there's a different mindset for shooting video where you can do vlogging, we can do storytelling, you can do documentary style. And there's a lot of information to know. So if you're really trying to maximize the value of your camera, there is a synergy of putting these all together and really understanding how this fantastic tool will change according to what you see in your mind. This is the key and this is why the Canon M50 crash course is so important to you as a camera owner is it's going to teach you how to pre-visualize whatever your goals are and then take the tools that I teach you with the camera and create incredible art. That's the goal and the goal is to do it in a couple hours. So it typically takes a couple weeks from the time that I publish this video. If you're interested, follow the link in the description, leave your email address in the comments on my blog, and we will reach out to you when it's ready. Another tremendous resource that I would recommend checking out is Tony Northrup's Stunning Digital Photography. Tony is a friend of mine, but he did not ask me to talk about this. I just think it's a great resource. He has an awesome YouTube channel publishes multiple videos every week, as do I, and I would definitely recommend subscribing to both of our channels. With all that in mind, let's get started. I wanna point this out real quick, is that you see this little green light flashing? This means the camera's in standby mode, so if you don't shoot with the camera, it's automatically gonna turn off the monitor. It's basically saying you need to turn your power switch off. So if you tap the shutter button, that's going to wake it back up, and when we go into the deep menu, there's a couple things I want you guys to change. The first, you're gonna see something a little bit different, and this is also touch monitor on the top here. So this menu display, if you have it on guided, you're going to see a different set of information. This is like the more basic view. I'm not a huge fan of it because we have far more 
settings and controls in the deep menu. So first thing you should do in the menu systems, because I'm not going to teach this, I hate to say Mickey Mouse version of it, uh, but that's, that's basically what it is, is we're gonna change this to standard. Okay, this is what we see on most Canon cameras, this type of a menu system, where red is shooting, blue is playback, we have yellow, which are which are camera settings. There's often an orange tab. It's integrated here with this one. And then we have the guide displays. Most of them I'm gonna have you turn off because I think they get in the way. And then we have our custom my menu tab. But anyway, the first thing I would say is, is get to this, turn off the assisted guided menus. And the second thing that I'm going to do on this video is, is the power mode, the power saving stuff, is that I don't want the camera turning off every minute. So I'm going to just turn this to 30, 10. Okay, that way the camera won't be shutting off while I'm recording. So when you're getting your camera set up, there's a couple things I want to point out real quick. Obviously, the battery is on the bottom. And the battery is small, it would be worth the investment to have at least minimum one extra of these, maybe more. So you can see the pins in there, which means we want the pins facing up towards the top of the camera. You're also going to notice that this is where the memory card is. I use a SanDisk, this is a 64 gigabyte SanDisk Extreme Pro. You're going to notice that this ha has a little symbol U3 on it. U3 gives you sustained writing speeds for 4K videos. So if you know you're going to do 4K video, at least get a memory card that has the U3. I personally like SanDisk, but there are a lot of good brands out there. So when we put this into the camera, the pins are going to be facing towards the monitor. This is something easy just to remember. And close it but again the battery is a little small at least get one extra one so let's go through all of the buttons and physical controls the ports of the camera so you know what i'm talking about later on in the lessons the shutter button if you are brand new to photography most cameras work this way is that when you push the shutter button halfway down it is going to engage the focusing systems of the camera if you are using autofocus if you're using a manual focus or you've recustomized your button that's not the case for beginning and intermediate photographers, what I tell them is to push the shutter button halfway down and to feel that spongy resistance. And by the way, if you don't have your camera in your hands, go and get it, pause the video, follow along as we go through these exercises. So feel that spongy resistance to focus the camera, push it down all the way to take the picture. That's one of the most basic skill sets you should start off with if you're just learning your camera. So this little knob around the shutter button is referred to as the main dial. It's going to be our primary control when we're changing things such as aperture, shutter speed. It'll allow us to move through some of the menus even though we have a touch screen. Uh, it's going to be used very often. To the right of that, we have the video record button with the red dot. Obviously, if you're going to record video, you're gonna press this to start and stop it. MFN stands for multi-function button, which is going to give us a number of items in a menu that I'll be pointing out later. The mode dial here is pretty important and there are far more icons on here than I think that you should worry about. What I tell all my friends who are just starting is to start off on the AV mode, aperture priority mode, you know, up to the point that you got a hang of all the other stuff we're gonna talk about. And then manual mode. These are the two modes that I use the most. Occasionally, a secret is to use P mode, program mode, uh, with flash. So if you're shooting at a, an event and you have a speed light on there, and you're changing a lot, P is the handheld speed light mode. All of these other, other modes, don't really use them. It's, it's usually A, V, M, or the video mode. Power switch, obviously, pretty important if you wanna turn the camera on. Here is the hot shoe mount. This is going to allow us to attach a larger flash than the one that comes with the camera. The camera has one built in, which is accessed by pulling up, and we'll be covering a little bit of that. If you're interested in, in how a speed light, a larger speed light, works in connection with the camera. We cover that on the M50 crash course. This is a little hot shoe protector. So when we're talking about the back of the camera, up here on the top, you're going to notice this little black dot to the right of the, the electronic viewfinder. That is a sensor, it's a battery saver. So when you pull the camera up to your face, this is going to sense your eye or is close to it and it's going to engage the EVF. When you pull it down, the back monitor, the large monitor will kick in. Most of your controls can be done from the back monitor and I'll be pointing those out when it happens. But there are a few physical buttons we have on the back. This little star button in the top right hand corner 
is your exposure lock or your flash exposure lock button. I rarely use it, but there is a way, and I'll show you this. The little squares with little dots inside, this is our focusing cluster point selector. We have our information button, which allows us to toggle different views on the back of the camera, very important. On the bottom, we have the play icon to obviously play back images. And then we have our deep menu button. We'll be spending some time on this. There's a huge section on the course where we pretty much cover everything. And I go into the philosophy of use, which is, is really kind of the intermediate to advanced understanding of what all these settings are. So this dial here, the directional pad, it, you're going to notice it has different icons, top, bottom, right, left. And then there's also a button in the very middle, it's a separate button. The middle button says Q. I know it's difficult to see, but this is like an enter button. So like on a computer, return or enter. So you push that into the camera body when you have selected something. On the bottom, we have the garbage can icon, which is going to allow us to delete images that we don't like. Typically, I reserve this for only really bad images. The rest, if, I, if I'm close, I like to see it on a big monitor before I make my decision. On the right, we have this little flash icon. It's going to allow us to toggle whether or not the flash is on. On the left, it says AFMF. That is your manual focus button. So you toggle that if you want to jump into manual focus. It's very quick. It's very easy. Most DSLR lenses have a, a manual focus switch on the lenses, but we're shooting with these M lenses that are small and compact and they don't, most of them don't have it. On the top, we have the strange icon, which is a box with a diagonal through it and a plus minus sign. That is your exposure compensation button. That's a very important button to know. And we'll be talking about that in depth. It's, it's going to get its own lesson on this course. It's so important. So with all this in mind, that is a quick overview of all the buttons, ports, and controls on your Canon M50. Let's start getting into some of the lessons. A couple things I wanted to point out on the kit lens that if you have this, and many of you will, this is the 15 to 45. You're going to notice there's this lock and this is to prevent the, the lens from opening the camera is set up in such a way that this has to be put into the 15 at least position before the camera will wake up. So just keep that in mind. There are other M lenses that do not have that lock. This is something that the kit lens definitely has. So on the left side of the camera, here we have the microphone port. And there are different microphones that I recommend. Obviously, if you're going to do any kind of serious video work, you're going to want to use this. So in terms of a lav mic or even an onboard mic. Right here, we have this little button. This is the lens release. You're gonna to have to push this in all the way. Kind of hard. Uh, when, anytime you wanna take a lens off, you're gonna, going to have to do that. And something else you're going to notice, this white dot on the camera body, this is going to line up with the white dot on the lens. So every time you put a lens on, you're gonna to wanna to make sure those are aligned. On the right side of the camera, where our hand would rest, right hand, we have the HDMI out, and we also have a USB port. So if you come underneath this gasket here, you're going to notice that this is the smallest HDMI out. This guy down here is our Wi-Fi button. This is going to allow us to connect to the Wi-Fi. We'll be talking about that in a later lesson. So let's talk about all these icons that we see in the different displays. And something you should become very familiar with is pushing the info button to change the view that you're getting. Just start pushing that a couple times to see all this different, these different screens. Something you need to know is that anytime you see a highlighted icon with this gray box, that means you can touch that box and change the controls right within it. Very important to note the Q mode. When you push the Q mode, you're going to be able to change a lot of these settings. When you don't see the box, it's going to remain locked. So that doesn't allow me to change any settings. Why? Because I need to focus on something, right? Did you see how it took a picture there? So there is a setting called touch shutter. It's right here. And I'm going to turn that off. If we continue to toggle that, we can turn it back on, turn it off. So now we are going to be able to focus by touching on the screen. And this is how I recommend setting it up. When you have touch enable on, anytime you bump the screen, it's gonna take a picture. But if we press the Q button, all of those menu items come up and we're able to change them. So I wanna take you through each of these real quick. On the left and right, we have the menu items. And those menu items subfolder is on the bottom. So if we're talking about the auto focusing mode, we could change our focusing modes from these three these clusters we'll be talking about. 
The next is the auto focus operation, whether it's a one-time focus or a repeated focus for moving subjects. We've been talking about all these individually in the focusing lesson. We have our drive mode, and these icons each mean something different. Single frame, high speed continuous burst, so if you hold the shutter button down, it's going to continue to take pictures. Low speed continuous bursts, not as many frames per second. We have our 10 second timer, our two second timer, and then we have the customizable timer. So we can come in here and we can customize the number of shots we want to take with the timer. One more thing on this continuous timer is that it, I believe it's the 10 second timer. So if you use this as a 10 second timer and then this is the number of images it's going to take. Metering modes are how the camera measures light coming into the camera. We'll be talking about this in depth in its own lesson. We have our image quality, which allows us to control the type of file we're creating, whether it's RAW or JPEG. You see all those options here on the bottom. The L stands for large, which is the full resolution. And as we get smaller and smaller, you can see it starts giving us the full dimension for large is 24 megapixels. In the brackets right here, this is the number of shots remaining on your memory card. Medium, which is 11 megapixels, and we get the resolution, almost 4,000 wide by 2,656. Then we have our, our smaller versions. Some of you will be wondering what the difference between the smooth and the jagged L. That is the compression type. And you'll notice the number of shots remaining changes, even though the resolution is the same between these. And so what's happening is in this jagged icon, the camera is throwing away certain types of information and the file sizes are almost half of what they are in the smooth. We also have the ability to go into the raw setting. So if I press info here, we can determine whether we're using standard raw or a form of compressed or compact raw that doesn't take up as much space. Raw files, the idea behind them is this is the raw information that's captured by the camera, has a lot more color information, has more dynamic range. Typically when you're shooting a landscape, it's a good idea to shoot raw. In those other situations, mixed lighting conditions, if you wanna capture all of the color information, things of that nature. We'll be talking a little bit more about this when you get into the menu stuff. So the movie record settings, so we have our different resolutions. 1920 by 1080 is standard HD. And there's a bunch of numbers in here, 60 frames per second. IPB has to do with the compression type. Most of the compression types on here are IPB. Notice all of them. I made up a little acronym for that saying, I like peanut butter. And uh, there's another compression type called All I, and this has to do with how the video frames are compressed. This, this is something that we're going to cover in the video lesson, but all you need to really worry about right now is that this is high def in the number of frames. So 60 frames, 30 frames, 24 frames, and we can also do 4K24, and that is set up in the video menu. So. Just real quick, let me show you where it is. We're on the subject here. Go over to video mode. Do you see this, this stuff that's popping up? So any, anytime I change the mode dial, it's giving me this little introduction to what it is. So I like to shoot manual. Okay, so what I wanna do is show you, and we, we get into this in the, um, in the crash course in depth, is there is the 4K right there. It's in the menu system. We're talking more about that on the crash course. I like shooting in 4K. We're limited to 24 frames per second, but there it is if you don't see it on our main shooting menu. So if we come back out, you're gonna see that this, this has changed. And there it is, it's 4K. So if you are not in the video shooting mode, this is the take home message, watch, I switch it over, press my info button, and that 4K option is gone. So that's what's happening. If you do not see that 4K icon, it wants you to be in the video icon mode before you select it. On the right side, white balance. We'll be talking about that in just a second. We have our picture styles. Think of these as recipes that are baking the files with certain types of color information and throwing the rest away. We have our auto light optimizer, which is going to help with some of the contrast. I usually turn it off, but some people like it. Creative filters I'm not a huge fan with, and because I have my raw turned on, it doesn't want us to select it, so we can come back in, turn raw off, and then here they are. 
These are kind of fun to play around with, but they're, they're, these are not serious tools that a professional would use. A lot of these are like the filters, you know, really, like really basic filters that you see on your smartphone kind of thing. And we have our still image aspect ratio. I recommend leaving it on three to two. My dad loves to shoot in 16 by nine, which is the cinema aspect ratio. Three by two is going to use all of your sensor. And if you want to crop that in post, you are welcome to do so. When you start picking these other aspect ratios, you're going to notice we get different re resolutions. So part of the image is being cropped. When, it say, when I say cropped, I mean cut off. So let me show you something real quick, is that if you pick a one-to-one -one aspect ratio and take a picture, and I play this back, we have a square image that's been cropped off. So the advice that I give is, is don't do that unless you know you're gonna go to straight to Instagram or something and you just wanna save the step, but usually most of the time, it just it makes more sense to shoot with the full aspect ratio, the full crop, and that way you have all your information. You can crop it later if you want. So that is the Q menu or the quick menu. You can get to it again by pressing the Q button or you can just push into the camera button right here. There's a dedicated Q button available. When we're out of the Q mode, I wanna walk you through all this information in here. The Q mode has all of the items on display, which one you have selected at the time. In the top left-hand corner, we have the mode we're shooting in, the shooting mode, number of shots remaining. This is how much video we can record before the camera will shut off. We have our battery, histogram, ISO, really important. We'll be talking about that in depth in the exposure lesson. These two guys right here, shutter speed and aperture, the most important settings when controlling how much light is coming into your camera. These three on the bottom, shutter speed, aperture and ISO are absolutely critical. As we push the info button, we are able to toggle through different screens. So if we don't like seeing all that stuff, we can push the info button, make it go away and we can shoot. We get a limited set of data. You're going to notice that the shutter speed, the aperture and the ISO are very common on almost all cameras on the bottom and also in the viewfinder as you look. The viewfinder is going to be a mirror of whatever we see on the back of the camera. As we continue to push the info button, we come to this, info, this black info screen. This is good because it's going to allow us to see all these settings a little bit larger and you get this little gray box, the Q screen. So we can access the quick menu both in live view as well as this black screen mode. And I wanna take you through all the settings in here real quick. So if I push the Q button, you're going to notice we get all these highlights showing up. Top left hand corner is the shooting mode. Shutter speed, aperture, ISO. This orange icon is saying this is what's going to change when you rotate your primary selector. So even though we're kicked out of the touch operation of the Q screen, we can still change the shutter speed by using the main control wheel. Come back into the quick screen. Another thing we can do is touch and rotate any of these items so we can change it without going into the sub menu, or we can double tap and we can touch and drag on the scale or if there's many icons. So there's multiple ways to change the information in the screen. We can do main command wheel, we can double tap. Is this an efficiency thing and what you prefer? Let me take you through the rest. So shutter speed, aperture, ISO. This guy right here, is our exposure compensation bar. It typically does not work in manual mode because manual mode, you see how we get these? I'm gonna show you how to turn that off in a second. Come back in, there it is. So we double tap on that and we can come in and change the brightness of the image. We can use something called bracketing that I'll be talking about a little bit later. Very powerful. This is something you're going to want to become familiar with. To the immediate right of that, we have something that looks very similar. We have this flash bolt plus minus. So this is exposure compensation. This is flash exposure compensation. Exposure is a fancy word for brightness. Compensation means changing. So what this, these two things do is this changes the brightness of the natural light we're shooting in. This is going to change the brightness of the flash we're using. I'll be going through what these numbers mean in a later lesson on this video. So just below this, we have our picture styles, which is something that basically 
controls how the color information is compressed into the file. We have our white balance. It's telling us which white balance we're selected, auto white balance. If we come in here, look at all the different white balances. We're talking about that in its own lesson. White balance shift, not a huge fan of, but we'll be talking about that. Then we have our auto light optimizer, the metering modes, which is how the camera measures light information. We'll be talking about that too. We're we'll talking about all these. Then we have our focus cluster selector. There's different focusing clusters that we use. One shot versus servo. Servo is continuous focus. We have our drives, which is what the camera does after we push a shutter button down all the way. We briefly have covered these from a single still. You guys want to hear a burst? Is what it sounds like. Try it out. So multiple frames per second. And lastly, we have our image size and quality. This is going to allow us to determine the size, the type, and the compression of the files we're capturing for stills. On the bottom, we have a little bit of information anytime we come. It's, the camera's trying to teach us is what's going on. This stuff drives me crazy because I feel like it gets in the way. So I want you guys to turn the mode guide and the feature guide. We're going to turn these off so we can talk like adults about this. The mode guide is what this is doing is every time I change the mode, it's giving us this overlay. It's trying to teach, you know, like give you some information in terms of what we're changing and why. And here's, here's this little screen. If you guys want to leave it on, you can, I think it gets in the way. So I am going to turn this to disable and this is going to allow me and you to get to our settings without tripping over those feature guides. So now when we come into the Q screen, we can just, touch and get right to it. Okay, so this is this is what I'm talking about is fewer steps, more efficient. So this is the info display and we can enter with the Q button. We also get a battery icon. So pushing the info button again, we're toggling through and then we're back to a regular shooting mode where we can see if we continue to press the info button we have cycled all the way around. Real quick, I want to point something out is that you'll notice is that as we're toggling through these information screens, we have lost the electronic level. What happened? Okay, there are there are a few little quirky weird things that when you turn some settings on, it changes settings in other places. And when you use face tracking, for whatever reason, we lose the level. So go to a single square, tap your shutter button, come back out, there it is. And so keep that in mind. That's one of the weird settings. The electronic level is great when shooting landscapes. When you get these two green lines, it tells us that the camera is nice and balanced. If I were to tilt it, you see how it's getting out of kilter, red. And you can also see this, this guy right here in the middle, that as you get closer to center, those become smaller and smaller. So it sees it as right there. I'm shooting a little bit elevated. So side to side, let's see if we can make this work just so you, so you guys can see. Get this. There's the middle line right there, it's green in the middle. So that would be perfectly centered, perfectly straight, and it's a great little tool to use. Something I need to point out is that when you play an image back, so this is the picture we just took, if you push the info button again, you can pull up different kinds of information, including what shot this is out of the sequence. We have our shutter speed, aperture, ISO. We have the quality setting, it's a file name. If we continue to push the info button, we get the histogram, which we'll talk about on the crash course. We have our picture style, the metering mode, auto light optimizer. We even have the size of the file. So if you continue to push the info button, it'll tell us the lens we used, the focal length that it was selected at. We get our RGB histogram. So there's a lot of information when you press that info button. So definitely get in the habit of doing that. It's very useful. If we come into the menu, there's something I want to show you real quick where we can determine the kinds of information that are showing. So on the fourth tab of the yellow icon, it says shooting info display. We come in here and we set this, we can come into screen info settings and we can determine the screens that pop up when we toggle the information button. So let's just go edit. See all this information in here? This is the electronic level. I like that. So just make sure that's turned on so you can see it. 
That's what's going on is that we can customize the information screens that we see. If there's something in here that you don't want to see, you can come in here and just turn it off and you won't see it anymore. So it's telling you on, on screen three, this is what you can expect to see. Go ahead, OK. And each of those screens that I showed you correspond with a different number. So you can customize them separately. It's very nice. It's a very nice feature. We can do the same for the viewfinder and toggle different settings as well. We have our grid display. This, these are a set of lines that appear on the overlay. So if we do a three by three grid, tap the shutter button, come out. You can see this allows us to line things up with architecture and things of that nature. It's not going to show up on the, on the image itself. I'm not a huge fan of it, so I, I typically leave it turned off. And, and so we'll be talking more about this, especially on the crash course, we're going to total depth on that. So there we go, kick back out. So the reason why I like shooting in front of my blinds is I can put different things up and we can look at things like white color, we can look at exposure, brightness. And so the thing I want you to do is, let's simplify the screen a little bit, kind of get to this mode, is we are going to talk about the four major modes here. P, program mode. Shutter priority mode, this stands for time value. Aperture priority mode in the manual mode. If you are a pure beginner and feeling super overwhelmed, you are going to be tempted to put it on the full auto mode. It's a little green A on the top of your mode dial, and you notice that we lose most of our settings. This is what I call the dummy mode. This is turning your camera into a point and shoot. It's sort of like having a, a race car and never driving over 35 miles per hour. Okay, this is really limiting your camera. So even if you're a pure beginner and you're super intimidated, I would say start off in program mode. If you are feeling brave and are ready to learn as fast as possible, I want you to shoot on aperture priority mode and struggle with it until you get the swing of things. And this is where we're going to start. I'm gonna talk about each of these modes individually and how to change the settings and why you'd want these different modes. Aperture priority mode means that we choose the aperture of the lens, which is the opening of the lens, and the camera is going to determine the shutter speed. So when we're in aperture priority mode, you're going to notice that the shutter speed is now missing. We cannot directly select it from this screen, and our primary or our main dial is now designating the aperture. So in aperture, aperture priority mode, if I start changing my aperture, so I'm, this is making the opening smaller as we go up, it's counterintuitive, something very strange is happening. The brightness is staying the same. How in the world is it possible for the brightness to stay the same when we are changing the diameter of the opening? There's not as much light coming in. So if we're making this diameter smaller, this should be getting darker. And what is happening is the camera is making the changes to the shutter speed. It's doing it automatically for us. This is why aperture priority is a great mode to shoot in if you're in changing lighting conditions. I was a wedding photographer for many years. And one of the trickiest situations was we'd go from inside the church to a lobby to the bright sunny outdoors in less than 15 seconds. So. If I had it on manual, I would have to change my shutter speed myself, but if I left it on aperture priority, I wouldn't have to worry about changing my shutter speed and I could look where I was walking and not tripping over people. I could think about composition. So, sports shooters use aperture priority mode often, depending on the sport they're shooting, of course, and this is going to turn control over to the camera. It's gonna make your life easier. So I wanna prove it to you. If you tap the shutter button, we get the shutter speed display. We can see it, but we can't change it. So as I rotate it, look what's happening here to the shutter speed. As we change the aperture, the shutter speed is being changed automatically by the camera. Now there are a few important shutter speed barriers you need to be aware of. The shutter speed is how long the light is falling onto the sensor. So it's a time value. So, one sixtieth of a second 
is the bare bones minimum, I believe, to shoot a portrait of a person. If you're shooting at a shutter speed slower than 1 60th of a second, such as 1 30th or 1 15th, often what happens is that either you move or your subject is going to move and the picture is going to be blurry. So if you're getting a lot of blurry images, the first thing I tell people is check your shutter speed. In an aperture priority mode, all you need to do is just take a glance. You can't change it directly. So what I do is I dial in my aperture and as I'm shooting, I sneak a peek over here at my shutter speed. Okay, that's how it works when I'm shooting aperture priority. Having said all that, another shutter speed barrier you should be aware of is when you're shooting sports. It depends on the athletes and how fast they're moving, but typically a, a running person, anything less than one five hundredth of a second, you're gonna run into problems. I like one one thousandth or even faster. And so let's say, for example, we were at a sporting event or you were shooting outside and we needed a faster shutter speed. In all honesty, the M50 is not a strong sports shooting camera, just so you know, it's one of the weaknesses. But let's say we're shooting and we need to get a faster shutter speed, okay? And we, we've opened our aperture as much as we can to let as much light in as we can and we're stuck at 250. How can we get a faster shutter speed? I want you to think about this. ISO is a boost. It essentially boosts the light coming into the sensor. It's an artificial gain. And so if you said use a faster ISO, you're absolutely correct. So if let's say we go to 3200, look what happened to the shutter speed. Shutter speed went up. And as we continue to add more and more ISO, the shutter speed is getting faster and faster. So something I want to point out real quick is we have this button on top of our camera called the MFN button or the multi-function button. And in a shooting mode like manual or aperture priority mode, this button controls your ISO. So if you're looking through the viewfinder and you want something customizable and quick, you come into your multi-function button and you could adjust it. And so now we're changing our ISO. It's a very fast, easy way to do it instead of going through the menus. Some people refer to, to the shutter speed aperture and ISO as the exposure triangle, but the only thing really dealing with light coming into the camera is your shutter speed and your aperture. ISO is an artificial boost. Now the trade-off on ISO, and we talk about this in, you know, in other lessons on the course, is that as you add more and more ISO, you're going to get more and more noise grain added to the image. It's actually going to degrade the image. I'm comfortable definitely at 1600, at 3200, you're going to start seeing some grain. And at 64 and 12800, you're going to see lots of grain. So up in, up in these areas, take a picture in low light with these settings and then zoom in and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, we can do it right now. Let's just go here. I'm going to change my aperture to make it as dark as possible. And you can see already. Now, we're going to be talking about touch screen. So if we zoom in, you can see, look at all the noise that was introduced. It's grainy. This is not a pleasing image. And that is mostly because we added so much ISO. So coming back out, let's go down to a very low ISO, something like 400. Shutter speed changed. So I'm going to open up my aperture. I'm on a tripod. If you're on a tripod, you can often get away with very long shutter speeds with landscape shooting. I'll take a picture. If we were to zoom in, look, almost no grain at all. So keep that in mind. There is a trade-off with the ISO in terms of grain that you're going to be getting. So talking about the philosophy of use when we're talking about using aperture priority mode, I want you to take your hand, tap the shutter button, and just move it in front of the lens, just like this. Look what's happening to the shutter speed. Most beginning photographers never get this, is that what's happening is the camera is measuring light in real time using different metering modes. The metering modes determine how that calculation happens. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. But if you understand this principle, the camera is measuring light, you're gonna be in really, really good shape conceptually. So now let's talk about exposure compensation. It's a fancy way of saying changing the image brightness. This bar in the bottom is going to tell us where we're at. You're going to notice we have a negative three, a negative two, and a negative one on the left-hand side. Then we have this like 
baseball home diamond plate, plus one, plus two, plus three. And what do those numbers mean? So the short answer on this is that if you take a picture and you want to make it brighter, is that you can change your exposure compensation. There's a couple ways to do this. You can come in here, touch on the bar. So I went from zero to one and I take another picture and I play those back. So here's the second one and here's the first one. This is a fundamental technique of photography is changing your image brightness. If you go out and practice that one lesson today, aperture priority mode and changing your brightness, you will have accomplished a ton in terms of the foundations of photography. It's changing the brightness from shot to shot. This is a big deal. I'm gonna tap the shutter button, come back out, and you're going to notice the exposure compensation bar is now at plus one. So what does that plus one really mean? That plus one refers to something called a stop. A stop is a fancy way of saying a measure of light. So if we go from zero to one stop, what we're saying is we have doubled the amount of light from zero to one. And I can prove this to you. When I tap the shutter button, I'm on a tripod, so I'm okay shooting at slower shutter speeds. It says 1 80th of a second, right? So watch what happens when we come in and we go to one again. Tap the shutter button. The shutter speed is 1 40th of a second. So what's happened is the camera is allowing twice as much light to come into the sensor by taking a twice as long shutter speed. 1 80th of a second plus 1 80th of a second is 2 80ths of a second, which is really 1 40th of a second. So my question to you is if we were to go to plus two, what do you think that shutter speed would be? Think about it. If you said 1 20th of a second, you are absolutely right. And we're letting in twice the amount of light. Again, 1 20th of a second is a long shutter speed. It's gonna to be tough to handhold and get still images. So maybe we don't like it, but for the sake of the example, I'm gonna finish this. If we go to plus three, you notice the screen's getting brighter too. Come back out, what do you think the shutter speed will be? If you said 1 10th of a second, you're absolutely right. And it also works in the other direction. So we come back home, we know this is 1 80th of a second. There it is. So let's say this was too bright. We wanted to make it darker. All right, exposure compensation, one stop down. So what do you think the shutter speed would be now? We're using a shutter speed that's twice as fast. It's a faster shutter speed. If you said 1 160th of a second, you're absolutely correct. And there it is. If, if this is all you walk away from today, you are well on your way. This simple principle of exposure changing exposure compensation. It's going to be pretty much the main thing you're going to, going to be changing in terms of camera settings. That's the settings that I change the most. There's some other ones like white balance and your focusing squares, obviously, but you're always monitoring your exposure settings with your shutter speed and aperture. So that's some really good information. Now, let me point out a couple other little things. We don't necessarily have to change it by touching on the screen. There are going to be times you're going to be looking through the viewfinder and maybe you just want to change it on the fly. So the way we do this is that we're going to push up on this little multi-directional pad. Watch what happens to this orange guy. Pushing up, it jumps over to the exposure compensation bar, and now we can tweak it in that way. This is going to allow you to do it looking through the viewfinder. A little bit more, a little bit less. Something else I wanna point out is that you'll notice that there are two little tick marks between the home plate and the one. These represent third stops. So zero to plus one third, two third, and a full stop. So we can dial in and change our exposure values by merely changing where that tick mark is, okay, by one third stop intervals. So that's the heart of the matter with aperture priority mode. We decide the aperture, the camera decides the shutter speed. If we decide to use exposure compensation, the camera, is going to change the shutter speed and it's going to do it even when the light changes. It's going to make those adjustments according and it's going to uh, 
respect the changes that we request on that bar. And that's why aperture priority is so powerful. This is the one you're probably going to shoot on the most, I believe. Let's talk about shutter priority. Look what happened. How funny. We lost our aperture priority mode and we're now in shutter priority mode and we change the shutter speed. Guess what? Oh, there's something interesting going on. Why is it changing the brightness so much? Hmm. We keep on rotating. We'll get to a point. There it is. So there's something very interesting happening is the camera should be making adjustments to the aperture. So if I tap the shutter button, there it is. You can see the changes and it's maintaining an even exposure, right? So what's going, going to happen is as we get to the physical limits of the lens and how wide it can open, and we continue to go faster, the aperture starts blinking. What it's telling us is that this lens is maxed out. It cannot open any wider. And as we use a faster and faster shutter speed, the camera, there's no way for the camera to compensate for this. And it's saying, hey, human, I need some help. Help me out here. This lens won't do what you're asking me to. And it gets darker and darker, right? So again, I'm going to ask you, if you are shooting a sporting event, let's say you're shooting in shutter priority mode. Some people do for sports. It's fine. And you're shooting at 1 500th of a second. It's indoors. And it's, this is what you're getting for the exposure. What would you do? How would you fix this? Some of you are going to say, oh, change your exposure compensation back down. Okay, I'll do that. Still not enough. How are we going to make this visible? If you said, turn your ISO up, you're absolutely correct. And there's different ways we can move this. We can touch and drag. We can use the arrows. So I push up. Now we're at 3200. We're almost in the ballpark. Yep, 4.5. This would work. So that is another important skill set is to use your ISO to adjust. Uh, you're basically boosting the light signal to make it more visible. Okay, if you want the precise language. Very important skill set to know. Also very important to know the limits of your camera in terms of uh, the ISO and the subject matter you're shooting. Sometimes it doesn't matter as much if you're shooting a bunch of trees. Sometimes it does matter. So as you learn your camera, cameras are like people to me. The more I, I'm around them and I shoot with them and I sometimes talk to them, I start to you know, learn their personality. And you'll learn the personality of your camera and what its limits are in terms of the ISO. So all the same rules apply here that we talked about earlier is that if we were to change the exposure compensation and let's say use negative one, the camera will make the adjustments to the aperture. So that's why shutter priority changes. We dial in the shutter speed, camera dials in the aperture. All the same rules apply with exposure compensation. We just need to make sure our lens can open that wide. See, it's not happy, so we'd have to bump it up some more. So that is shutter priority. Program mode is a little weird because you're going to notice the shutter speed and the aperture controls are both gone. We just have our exposure compensation bar. We can dial this in, change our brightness. And when we rotate the dial, you can see that not much is happening in terms of the actual settings. If we touch and press, we can see the shutter speed and the aperture. Now, hey, something is happening. And this is the heart of the matter with program mode is that as you rotate this dial, it is going to make different suggestions based on the amount of light coming into the camera. It's not always what you see is what you get um, in, unless you push the shutter button. So if you don't see this stuff, you may not even know what you're shooting on. So if you're on program mode, definitely tap the shutter button and take a look at the settings it's giving you because it's going to fade off. And if you don't see it, you can be shooting with some really wonky settings. Uh, you know, come down here like this. 1 30th of a second, F25. And if you're trying to hand hold, all your pictures are going to be blurry. And so this is why I'm not a huge fan of program mode is it's often very confusing. The one time I recommend program mode is when we're using flash at an event where you're shooting lots of people and you're bouncing around quickly from different lighting situation to different lighting situation. For Canon cameras, P is the handheld flash mode. And that's something a lot of people don't know. It basically ensures that you will have a shutter speed of at least 1 60th of a second. And you can shoot with an onboard flash and the background's not going to be all crazy. So that is a powerful tool to know if you ever do 
flash photography, especially for event shooting. So now let's talk about manual mode. I am a huge fan of manual mode. I use it probably 25 to 30% of the time. And because I, I use aperture priority mode so much, these are tools. You're not better or worse if you use aperture priority mode over manual or manual over aperture priority. The way I deal with this is I ask myself the question, do I have enough time to dial in both my shutter speed and my aperture? If I don't have enough time, if time is limited, I'm usually on aperture priority mode. If I'm shooting in a studio and we're controlling the light and the model and the art and the makeup and we, we have plenty of time, then yes, absolutely manual mode because you can dial it in, you know exactly what you're getting every time and the camera isn't going to change anything. So in manual mode, a few really interesting things happen. Number one, you're going to notice the exposure compensation bar is no longer active. And that's because the camera will not be making changes. So there's no exposure compensation in manual mode. Second thing is we get both the shutter speed and aperture controls with the control dial being locked onto the shutter speed. So we can change the shutter speed and you're going to notice we get an immediate preview of the exposure. The camera is not making any changes. So this is what you see is what you get in the preview mode. If we want to change the aperture, we're going to push up on our exposure compensation button here. Watch what happens. See how it toggles? And so that is how you can change the shutter speed or the aperture through the viewfinder. You can also touch on the screen, change it here if you want. But as you're shooting through the viewfinder, it's very nice, it's very fast and easy to just be able to push up and shoot. Some people love shooting off the back monitor. I do that for video. On very bright days, however, you're gonna to wanna to look through this EVF here. And I think this is why I like the M50 over some of the earlier M mirrorless Canon cameras is that they didn't have a viewfinder. It was just this back monitor. And sometimes it gets a little hard to see when it's really bright. So this is very, very nice. So in summary on manual mode is that we dial in the shutter speed, the aperture, ISO, the camera makes no changes or adjustments to those settings. Again, I'm shooting AV about 70% of the time, manual mode probably about 25, 30% of the time, and, and that's it. And the only other mode I, I touch is the video mode. So in conclusion on the modes in the exposure controls, we talked about each of the four most important modes. I made my recommendations in terms of which ones, AV and manual are the ones you should be focusing on. We talked about changing the exposure settings in each. We talked about exposure compensation in the bar indicator. We talked about the philosophy of use and how the camera is measuring light and making these adjustments accordingly. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's a fundamental part of photography. Your homework for this lesson is to go into aperture priority mode, take a picture of something, change the exposure compensation and take another picture to make it brighter and then make it darker. So even, over and under. Three pictures and compare them. If you master that one skill set today, you are making tremendous progress. Let's talk about our camera's focusing systems. It can be very complex and confusing. I like it to break it down in terms of the how, the when, and the where. How, when, and where. If we can just think of it in this way, this is going to be a lot easier. So how does the camera focus? A half shutter button depression out of the box is what's going to engage the camera's focusing systems. Now there's a problem here, is that as I push this halfway down, I'm getting this MF in the top left hand corner. If you see this, that means manual focus because I've engaged this by pushing or bumping the AF MF button. So we're gonna make sure that that is turned on. And as soon as we get there, we auto focus and we see this box. This box is basically telling us where the camera's focusing. We'll talk about that in a second. We have a touch monitor so it makes it easy to move around. But how does the camera focus with a halfway shutter button depression? This is indicated with the green box and a beep. Pushing down all the way takes the picture. It's a great exercise to try is just hear that beep, hear the lock, take the picture. So the next part of this is when is the camera focusing? This has to do whether it's a one-time focus lock or 
whether or not this is a continuous focus. So there's two modes that we have right here, one shot or servo. It's just like it sounds like one shot means you get focus lock once and you're good to go. Servo is a predictive focus. The camera is going to try to predict where a moving subject will be by the time you push that shutter button down all the way. This is ideal for sports shooting. So in terms of the win, it's once or over and over and over again. Now something about one shot I need to point out is that if you push and hold the shutter button halfway down, that is going to lock the focus, which means that if I, let's say I have a person here and I wanna, and I wanna get them to the side of the camera, I can hold down and move the camera. This is called recomposing. I am recomposing the subject matter and then I push it down all the way to take the picture. It's a very handy skill set to have. Most photographers for DSLR shooters, they know how to, how to do this. So as an exercise, I'd recommend get on one shot mode, push the shutter button halfway down, keep it held down, and recompose your subject matter to make it more aesthetically pleasing. Great tip, it's called recomposing. So I wanna point out when we are in servo mode, look what happens. The box is now blue. What the camera is telling us is that the focus is repeatedly engaging over and over and over again. Wherever we move the camera, wherever that box is, that is where the camera is readjusting the focus. We cannot easily recompose in servo mode because the camera thinks we're looking at moving subjects. And so recomposition only works on that one shot mode. So we can only lock focus on one shot with a halfway shutter button depression. So when does the camera focus? If we're on one shot, it's just once. If we're on servo, it's over and over and over again. Next, let's talk about the where. This has to do with the camera's focusing clusters. I say clusters because they refer to different boxes. And the way we access those, there's a couple ways. But I'm gonna show them to you in this minute. Let's go back to one shot. But the focusing clusters are right here. We have autofocus face detection and tracking. We have a zone cluster, which is looking at a specific area, and we have one point autofocus. So when we're on one point autofocus, this is basically a square. We can touch on our monitor and move the square very, very quickly anywhere we want. We can also push the focusing cluster buttons, basically what it is. And this is going to allow us to push the menu button to change the size of the square. If we want to be more precise, if we push the info button, it will recenter it. Or we can just touch on the screen. So those are some additional single square controls for that particular cluster. One more thing I need to show you is our main dial now controls a magnifier. Very useful if you wanna jump in to focus. I do this more with manual focusing. We'll be talking about that in a second, a second with peaking. But this is good stuff. You can punch in. It's, it's just a magnification of the screen. The image isn't gonna be that punched in. So you're just magnifying it. Let's take a look at some of the zones. Come back out. So the zone is looking at a larger area. This is usually something I use for birds in flight and sports shooting because birds are moving so fast that I can only kind of get them into a general area. And so it's looking within this restricted area for something contrasty. It's noticing the target I put up. And so those little green boxes are indicating the new focusing area. When we push the focusing cluster button in this mode, you're going to notice that all we can do is jump back to the center or we can zoom in if we use our control dial. So let's come back out and take a look at face detection and tracking. So I'm going to show you face detection in just a second, but first I want to show you the tracking. It's not perfect. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's trying to look for an area of contrast and because I'm on the single shot mode, it's not engaging the focusing system. It's just following the movement of this high contrast target that I've put up there. And then, so once it's moving around, we're ready to take the picture, halfway shutter button depression, and there we go, right? So on servo mode, it's a little bit different. The idea is that it should be tracking that subject over and over and over again. Let's see what happens. We'll put it, there it goes, see, we'll cut it off. And now it's confused. So 
in a perfect world, it's going, going to work great every time. You know, Canon cameras, this has improved over time, but the truth of the matter is for, for video shooting, it's easily tricked. When you're using a person's face, however, it is a completely different ball game. It's far better, far more accurate than this tracking box. But it's something you should definitely try and, and play around with. Let me put up a face target so we can see how that works. So we have this amazing model who showed up and I am on the same mode. The thing about this mode is it will recognize a human face and it does very well tracking. It's, it's a very good mode. So now if I push a shutter button halfway down, we get the blue box and it's tracking it. What if we wanted to just focus on this instead of the face? We tap on it. And again, to engage the server, we'd have to push shutter button halfway down. Now this is different in the video mode. I'll be demonstrating this in just a second. But face in tracking mode allows us to designate whether we want a human face or not. It is really good for portrait shooting. So when we're in this focusing cluster, something else I need to point out is that we have the option to select different faces. So I'm gonna use my iPhone. I, I literally just shaved my head recently. I do this every once in a while. Here's another picture of me, right? So if I wanted to select this face, we're telling the camera which face to select and then it would try to follow that specific face. This is a very cool feature. And you can see that the focusing is changing as I'm moving this around. So even though it doesn't appear like it's doing something, see how it jumped? It's still focusing. You're going to notice the light is changing too. What's happening is the camera is metering specifically from the target area and it's making adjustments to the shutter speed based on what it sees here. And so as I move it away, it's very precise. It's pretty good in terms of the size of it. At some point, it'll, it'll lose it completely. There it goes. But I, I've shot with many Canon cameras over the years. It's gotten much better. This is like a pre-focus and then when you're ready to shoot, there it is. If we go into the one shot, let's see if it does a better job tracking. There I am. Yep, it's, go it's getting a pre-focus is what it's doing. And then when you're ready to shoot, there it is. So that's some behind the scenes of how that works. So let's talk about eye detection. Eye detection is going to allow the camera to dial in on a specific eye of a person. To enable it, you're going to have to come into the red tab, page six, eye detection autofocus. We are going to want this on enable. Coming back out, tap the shutter button. So the way this works is the camera needs a certain amount of real estate to see the person's eye. You can see that as I'm zooming in, there's a box jumping on to my left eye, or we see it as a right eye. Push the shutter button halfway down and the camera is locked onto the eye. So that is eye detection, a very powerful tool. We see it in other camera systems, especially if you are shooting at very wide apertures. Okay, so like 2.8, 2.0. If you're shooting with a very, very wide aperture lens, we want the eyes of our subject to be in focus, and this is a very powerful tool for portraits. Something you're going to notice is that as we come over to the video mode, we lose the eye detection. So this is only a still shooting mode only. So I've changed the targets up a little bit because I want to demonstrate the manual focusing tools. There's a couple different ways we can do this. So a very powerful technique that we, we can talk about for video is pulling focus using the touch monitor. In fact, let's just do that real quick. I'm going to jump over to, you're going to notice that we got this crop that we're punched in. It's because we're shooting at 4K and we get a little bit of a crop. So I'm going to demonstrate this on full HD and they fit. You're going to notice this servo auto focus, it's a green dot. Basically what that means is the camera is going to be adjusting the focus based on what's selected. And a very common technique in, in Hollywood is something called pulling focus or to rack your focus. Basically tells the camera to look at a specific point when you want to shift the interest of the viewer to something going on. Obviously we turn the sound off, but in the past, this could only be done using a certain type of gear wheel that you would put on the lens and you'd have a camera operator do it. And this touchscreen interaction, Canon with the Canon 70D really is the one who pulled it off successfully. It eliminates the need for all these 
extra accessories. You can literally pull focus by touching on the monitor. It's very smooth. It's very impressive. Even on the M50, this is something special, how well this does this. If you do not want the camera to change the focus and you want to keep it locked, you could do that. It's going to allow you to designate the area, but it is not focusing. That's what the gray box means, and we can turn it back on. So I wanted to demonstrate that difference for video. Coming back out, if we go into the Q menu, you can see that we still have all of our same clusters. I like the, the square a little bit more. It's a little bit more precise. If we push the cluster bar, you can see that this is changing the info. It's not really, you can only center it. It doesn't give us a smaller box. These are some subtle differences between shooting video. The truth of the matter is often in video, you are not going to want to use any focus. You're gonna be on manual focus. In a technique that I've been doing is, what I'll do is I'll touch to focus. I know it's focused there. And then I turn it off. This is essentially manual focus. We know we're dialed in. We can even push the switch over. So we know this is not going to change. In the early days of vlogging, this was something, the only way you could do it because the camera would be jumping around everywhere and changing focus. So often when I'm vlogging, I'll be on manual focus, but the truth of the matter is the M50 is so good with its face tracking, you could leave it on, get your face tracking, your face detection, come back you know, in, go face, and that's a pretty good setup for vlogging. It would be framed obviously a little different, you know, depending on how you're framing it. Very powerful, very good. It's as good as anything I've seen in higher cameras. It's really pretty impressive. It's right in that league. Coming back out to still shooting, I wanna show you a couple more techniques. I'm trying to give you guys as much as I can in terms of the operation of the camera, is there's a technique that I refer to as manual zoom focus. So we pick an area, we come into manual focus, and we get our zoom. So that zoom box punched in, and we're on the wrong side of what we wanna see. So this is going to allow us to use the front zoom ring and dial this in precisely. So we're looking for the sharp edge of the tape there. A couple other things is again, we can rotate in and out to zoom in. Look how close we can punch in. 10 times, we can recenter by pressing the info button and jump out. But I wanna show you another tool that's really powerful. Here it is. This guy right here, manual focus peaking settings. I like red. I'm gonna show you what it is, but we need to turn it on first. Very subtle, it's there. See this red outline? So what peaking does is that when we are in the manual mode, it's going to give us a red outline of the areas of highest contracts. So if we zoom in, we can see that contrast again. And I'll show you how to get around what this problem is having. It disappears. Okay, so keep that in mind is that you can, I hope you guys can see it, it's right there. We can change the color of it if we wanted to. Let's go with uh, blue. Very faint, very hard to see, it's there though. And then when we toggle back out to our regular autofocus mode, it disappears. I look at my face, you can see it now. Probably shows up a little better over there. Most cameras, when you zoom in, it maintains the peaking control. And as far as what I'm seeing right now, we're kind of locked to it without the zoom, which is fine, you can still see it. Just know that the contrast isn't always the most precise focus, but this is very helpful, especially when you're shooting like on a field and you wanna know exactly where the, the depth of field is, put it on blue, you'll see it right away. So that is peaking. So for the focusing, we have talked about the different techniques, the how, the when, the where. We've talked about the clusters. We've talked about moving the clusters. We've talked about face detection, tracking, servo for video, pulling focus. We've talked about peaking focus, manual focus zoom. Those are tons of great techniques that you will use time and again. Let's get into talking about white balance. And I am shooting pure white blinds in my living room. And I love using these blinds because it allows me to demonstrate what this means. White balance essentially allows the camera to know 
the type of light we're shooting in. Our eyes are very good at adjusting to sunlight or fluorescent light or LED lights. Cameras cannot do this as easily as human beings because human beings have very complex and sophisticated eyeballs. For the most part, you're going to be using something called auto white balance. We're giving the camera permission to figure out what the best balance settings are for the light we're shooting in. But you will notice on the bottom here, we have all these other icons. One's a sun icon. Let's go ahead and touch it and see what happens. One's a shade. One's a cloud. Then we have a tungsten bulb and it, you can see it turned really, really blue. We have fluorescent light, flash, custom white balance, Kelvin even. It's a great tool. If you are a pure beginner or even intermediate shooter, I would say stick with auto white balance. When you are shooting on auto white balance and you get into a situation where the camera, the, the feeling and the mood is either like blue or it's a little bit too yellow, what's happening is the camera is shooting in light that it's not properly dialed in for. So if you're shooting outdoors, the idea is that you would have the sun icon. If you're shooting in shade, the idea is you have the shade icon. If you are shooting under cloud cover and so on and so forth. So the short answer is you want to be shooting in the light temperature that corresponds with these icons. So if you're shooting with a flash, you'd use the flash icon. That's the short answer. There is a longer answer on the crash course where I go into the philosophy of use and how white balance has different temperatures. It's a little confusing and it takes a little bit of amount of time, but if you watch that, you're going to know exactly how it works. Let's talk about real quick how to adjust custom white balance. Custom white balance essentially means is that we take a picture of something and we're telling the camera this is white. So how do we designate this? Well, we took the picture. We're going to come into the menu. We're going to find white balance. We're going to go to custom white balance. And we're going to hit set. So what we're doing is we're telling the camera to use that picture of the white blinds as its reference. Hit OK. And then when we come back out, make sure that we're set on custom white balance. And look how clean and nice that is. So that is very useful if you are shooting in mixed lighting conditions, like at a wedding, and the color, you just can't get it right. So the idea is that you take a picture of something white. It could be a bride's dress. It could be a tablecloth. It could be a wall and you tell the camera this is white and the camera should respect that. Now, the moment you move into a different lighting condition, this is going to change the color. It's often referred to as the temperature, but videographers, people who are recording, very useful to custom white balance in, in mixed lighting conditions. And there's one more that's also super useful is the Kelvin white balance right here. Kelvin white balance, if we want to set the color temperature, we're gonna push the cluster button. And this is, is kind of getting into the philosophy of use a little bit. The short on it is color temperature is rated on a Kelvin scale. It's usually like 26, 2700, all the way up in some cases to 10,000, just depends on the camera. There it is. You're going to notice it's very blue. What's happening is when you set the Kelvin temperature to 2500, we're telling the camera to add blue because 2500 is typically very yellow light. It's counterintuitive. This is why this appears so blue. If we tell the camera to use a higher Kelvin temperature, let's come into here, you're going to notice it's going to start getting more and more yellow. So the camera is doing the opposite. It's adding more yellow light to counteract the blue temperature. That's what you're seeing. Most light sources have a Kelvin reading. 5600 is typically daylight. And you can see it's a little yellow-ish. So I'm gonna come down a little bit more. I'm using LEDs that I think are set to 4600, something like that. And you can see it's very white. So that's what's going on with color temperature is we have these presets for specific situations. We can custom white balance and we can also Kelvin white balance. But I'll have a special section for this on the crash course. Something else you're going to see is that we can tweak and shift the white balance color. This is something I would just recommend stay away from. I don't think it's necessary at this point. Focus on custom white balance, Kelvin white balance, and the icons. 
So that is white balance. Let's talk about the camera's metering system. If you remember the example when we were talking about exposure, is that the camera's constantly measuring light coming through the lens. You can see the shutter speed changing. So I've set up a headlamp right here. If we come into our menu, we have these metering modes, and there's four of them. The easiest way for me to explain this is with the spot metering mode. So when we select this and come out, what you're going to notice is that we have this little circle just above the focusing square right here. Kind of hard to see. So what we're telling the camera in the spot metering mode is to only measure light coming from this little circle. So if I tap the shutter button, watch what happens to the shutter speed in aperture priority mode. The camera's looking in this circle for brightness information. Off to the side of the lamp, we're at 1 125th of a second. And as I move over the bright light, shutter speed changes. So the heart of the matter with the metering modes is that we're telling the camera to look in different places to measure light. When we come back out, I typically get beginners on the evaluative metering mode. It looks at the entire frame, but there's also some measurement, I believe, of color information on the focusing square, because you can see it also changes depending on where we are focusing. And this is a good general purpose one to start. When we look at something like the partial metering mode, come back out, you can see that that center circle from the spot metering mode has grown. So we're just use, using a larger area. This would be ideal if you're, for example, shooting portraits with backlight coming in through the corners and we're telling the camera, hey, just look mainly in, in this center area. Uh, evaluated with the squares also good. It really depends on what you're doing. If that's not working, you can always go to manual mode and just dial it in so the exposure doesn't change at all. It's something that I do a lot. And then finally, the last one, I'm always bumping the wrong menus because I got to touch it with the side of my finger. And the last one is the center weighted average, which essentially is going to expand the circle. It's going to evaluate everything, but it's looking at a bigger area. So those are the metering modes. And the ones, again, I recommend to start off with are the evaluative and the spot metering until you get a hang of it. And by then you'll probably start switching over to manual when you get in those situations to really control exposure. Another technique I need to demonstrate in relation to metering modes is the ability to lock your exposure once you're happy with the preview. So let's say you're shooting a portrait and you're focused on a person and you're happy with it and you do not want the exposure settings to change. You're at 1 160th of a second with an F5. That's where this button comes in, this top little star button, which is referred to as the exposure lock. If you're using a flash, it is going to be the flash exposure lock button. All you need to do is press this, and I'm gonna tap the shutter button so you can see 1 160th, 160th of a second. When you push that, you see you get a little star in the bottom left-hand corner. And when I change and move it around, you can see that the the metering of the camera is now locked. So that is the exposure lock button. It is going to lock your exposure in the program, aperture priority, or shutter priority modes. Manual mode is exposure lock, so this doesn't apply to manual mode. Let's talk about the camera's built-in flash. It's not very large and it's very close to the lens, which is why I'm not a huge fan of it. However, if you are in a jam when you're shooting, let's say a friend with heavy backlight and you want just a little bit of fill, this can really come in handy. To activate your flash, all you need to do is grab it on the sides and lift it up. Come over to your directional pad, push to the right, and you just get two options, flash off or flash on. And at this point, the flash is on. This is gonna be way too bright. It's gonna overexpose the image for sure. See how bright it is, actually not too bad. And we will talk about using a speed light, an onboard speed light on the full crash course where we get in and talk about all the different concepts. You know, it's like a half hour, 40 minute crash course to show you how to use a real full size flash and the concepts and philosophy of use, things of that nature. But in this video, all you really need to know is that when you're using the flash, you can also control the power. See how bright, it's, it's overexposed, it's too bright. So what we're going to do is come into the black information screen we talked about earlier, press the Q button, and we're gonna come over here to flash exposure compensation. You can see I have it turned up. We're gonna turn that down to zero. 
And this is set up the same way as regular exposure compensation, where these numbers represent stops. So a, a zero or an even exposure means the camera is going to try to get it even, the, the flash exposure even. And if you wanted to make it brighter, you would turn it up. So let's just go ahead and do that. Let's come back out to our info screen. Still a little bit too bright. So let me demonstrate this in manual so the camera is not changing anything. And what I'm going to do is artificially make this darker by using a, a shutter speed of 1 200th of a second. Now you'll notice that when I get there, it doesn't want to let me go faster than 1 200th of a second. The reason is, is that is the camera's max sync speed. So when you're using flash, the fastest shutter speed you can use is 1 200th of a second. And this is because we have a first shutter that opens and a second shutter that closes. And when you get to 1 200th of a second, what happens is we get this traveling slit is that to use faster shutter speeds, they, they start moving like that. And so if you were able to shoot with a faster shutter speed, you'd start to see the image being clipped out. So what I'm going to do is artificially turn this down a little bit. And you'll notice the exposure didn't change. The camera is, is giving me a preview because I have my flash up. So if I turn my flash down, now it's saying, oh, it's too dark. It's just measuring the ambient light. As soon as you pull that flash up, this changes everything for the exposure preview. What's happening is the camera temporarily halts live view in order for you to see what you're shooting potentially in a dark situation. So the camera can focus, things of that nature. So let's take a picture and see what happens. Should be darker. Yeah, that's, that's about what you would expect to get. And you can see it's actually a very different look. The ambient light is darker, but I'm still exposed properly. Let's say I was too bright in this kind of a situation. We need to come back into our Q screen to access flash exposure compensation. We'll turn it down. Just one stop. And we'll compare those. This is actually a really good exercise if you guys want to get the hang of it. And you can see there is a very subtle difference between these two. Let's say the second one was too dark. All right, no problem. Let's come back out to our Q screen. Come back out to flash exposure. Let's just turn it up all the way. Take a picture here. Should be way brighter. Yep, there it is. So on playback, I'm going to toggle the info button. And you can see that I am way overexposed. But that is the concept in the heart of the matter with flash exposure compensation is that you can control the power of it and determine the brightness of your subject. One important note is that your flash ability is dependent on distance. So as your subject gets further and further away, this is going to be less and less effective. It also doesn't have a lot of power. So if you, if you need something with more firepower, you're going to want to get an external flash. So in terms of external speed lights, good knockoff version made by Godox. Canon has the flagship ones you can spend for an EX600 RT version 2. You can spend up to $450, $500 and everything in between. I usually teach with the full-size knockoff versions because they have pretty much as much power and as many features as the full-size Canon one. Either that or it'll be the full-size Canon flash. So that is a quick crash course on using your internal built-in flash. So now that we've covered most of the basic shooting features of the camera, real quick, I wanted to talk about video because the menu items are going to change a little bit once we flip over. You can see that now we're way overexposed, our ISO's too bright. Let's turn this down to 100, 200. There's a few different things in here that we need to point out is when you are shooting, depending on the frames per second, you'd have to pay attention to your shutter speed. So we can find out the resolution in frames per second by coming to this third item on the left in the Q screen. So when we go to this, this screen, if we press the Q button, we get all of our different resolutions here on the bottom and they have different numbers and letters. And so what, what do those mean? Real quick, let's talk about it. 4K, we get the Pixel resolution right there is 3,840 pixels wide by 2,160 pixels tall. Then we get the number of frames per second, which is 24. And that is what the industry standard is for motion pictures, films. So if you wanted to shoot something cinema-like, you would shoot at 24 frames per second. And it also tells you the amount of time remaining. 
If we go to full HD, you can see that the resolution changes. And now we have a lot more time to shoot. And we're shooting at 60 frames per second. We can also shoot at 30 frames per second, which is the video standard. And the difference between 60 and 30 is obviously twice as many frames. But the reason why this is important is if you shoot at 60 frames per second and you play back at 30 frames per second, things are going to be slowed down twice as much. This is how slow motion happens is when you capture in higher frame rates. Some cameras will let you shoot as high as 180 or 240 frames per second. And then you slow that down in the editing and it looks really cool. We can also shoot at 24 frames per second with standard definition. And then we also have the 60 frames per second at 720, which is a lower resolution. So I don't really use this a lot. Another important thing to note is that when we go to 4K, you're going to see it magnify a little bit. And this is referred to as a crop factor. So when we're shooting full HD, we're using the entire sensor. When we're using 4K, we're punching in just a little bit. And this has to do with how the camera is sampling information. It can't sample the full size uh, frame fast enough for the processor to deal with it. It's a lot of intensive calculating. And so in order to make it easier, the camera is looking at the more central part of the frame. That's, that's what's happening when you're in 4K. I typically like to shoot in 4K. We're shooting this in 4K right now because it gives me some options in post-production. I can punch in, I can zoom out. And if you're just getting started, I think my advice would be to stick with full HD for now at 30 frames or 24 frames per second. If you're shooting for YouTube, go for 30 frames per second until you get the hang of it. Another consideration is how fast your computer is because these are very processor heavy intensive files. So you may want to shoot a short clip in 4K, 24 frames per second, and just see how your, your computer handles it. But if, I, if I'm doing something important and I need to, to move in around, I'm always shooting in 4K. Some of these other things like the focusing clusters, you see we, we lose the zone. We just have a spot and then a face or the tracking. When we come up to the movie mode, and you're also going to see this the first time you go into the movie mode, it's going to ask you, do you want manual movie or regular movie? And the thing is, I do not want you guys using this one. I want you using the manual movie mo mode because this is going to allow us to determine the shutter speed and the aperture. With this one, the camera is going to be making changes to, the, to those exposure settings. So if you're doing run and gun type video work, probably better. But most of the time, 80%, 85% of the time, I'm on manual exposure settings because I get to dial in exactly what I want. So that's the difference between those two guys. But we have our manual controls. Something else to note is that your shutter speed should be about twice the frame rate. So if I'm shooting at 30 frames per second, I want to be at 1 60th of a second. That's going to give me a film-like look. It's a lot to go into, but the short is double your frames per second. If you're going for a film-like look, it's a little bit too dark, so I can come in here and adjust that a little bit. This is why I like manual. Looks like I'm still in the 4K mode. Come into our resolution. We'll go for 30 frames, come back out. Something else we're going to talk about is the audio levels in just a second. Let's see what else we've got in here. These movie effects, they can be fun. They're kind of gimmicky. We have our auto light optimizer for video. We have our picture styles. Picture styles essentially, and this is the same for video as well as stills, it allows us to adjust contrast, saturation, sharpness, things of that nature. And we can even come in and tweak each of those settings here. This is something I, I kind of turn beginners away from. It, it's more of an almost beginning of an advanced kind of thing. So just enjoy your camera for now, shoot for now on the auto picture style. But the idea is, is that certain colors will be shifted in favor of your subject matter. So if you are shooting portraits, the flesh tones are supposed to be more accurate. If you're shooting landscapes, your blues and greens are going to pop more, things of that nature, and you know, or, or more sharpness for fine detail, maybe a little bit neut more neutral. And videographers are very heavy into tweaking these. They'll turn down their contrast, they'll turn down their sharpness. And that's something that would come into play 
for, for video is you wanna to try to get it as close as you can in camera because we don't have raw video on you know, our M50. You can shoot raw stills, but you cannot shoot raw video and the video is a form of JPEG. So it makes more, it's a lot more important to get your white balance and your picture styles dialed in correctly. And again, we all obviously want our white balance dialed in as best we can. And, and it looks good for me right now. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. Shooting video, something you have to know is there, there are built-in microphones in the front. You can see the, the little ports for them. They're not the best. So if you're do, looking to do high quality vlogging work, you're going to want to get an external microphone that you would put on the top. There are Rode shotgun microphones you can get for about 150 bucks. You can get used ones all day long for less than $100. It's going to make a huge difference. I like to use lavalier mics. I'm using one right now. I use the Sennheiser E100s and I've been using them for years because I can get the microphone close to me. Otherwise, anytime you touch the camera or move the camera around, those sounds are going to be picked up by the internal microphone. So external microphone plugged into the side port. We do not have headphones on the M50, so you'll have to do some testing to make sure it works. But one thing you can do is let's see if we can get those audio levels popping up. There's that. There they are. So you can see our audio levels in here, and this black info screen has changed a little bit. So to access some of these, we're gonna press Q. And right now I have it on A, and as I'm talking, you can see these little red dots here. Those are bad, that means your audio is too loud and it's clipping out. Another thing that's bad is the A for automatic. We're gonna want that on manual. So we come into the sound recording. I'm going to select this and go to manual. And the difference between these two is manual allows us to adjust the gain level for the microphone. And we're gonna turn this down. Watch what happens to the bars on the bottom as I'm talking. See how it's getting lower and lower? Still clipping out, that's bad. I would probably shoot around something like this where, where a normal voice could bounce up into the yellow range, but very loud noises would obviously clip out. This is going to capture all of my audio profile and, and the quality of the sound is going to be better. So any kind of serious video work that has good audio, definitely put it on manual and adjust your gain accordingly. Let's take a look at some of these other menu items real quick. I changed my, I'm gonna put that back on auto. The attenuator. Wind filter and attenuator. So it doesn't really help a whole lot. I think the idea is that this is to help block wind out. I usually turn it off. Here's the attenuator right here. This is to help, to help dampen the sound. If you turn it on, you notice how the levels go down significantly. If you turn it off altogether, it comes up. I think it's, it's fine just to turn this off unless you're in a situation where you really need to dampen your sound and you need to turn it down more than you turn it on. Not a huge fan of the audio attenuator or the auto mic gain because what happens is you start getting these fluctuations in sound and you can't really control it. And so when it's quiet, the camera thinks, oh, my microphone isn't sensitive enough and it turns up the gain. And so when the person starts talking, it's too loud and then the camera goes, oh, it's too loud and it turns. And so there's this constant fluctuation. It's quite maddening. So this is why we like to keep it on manual. So now we're gonna start getting into the deep menu and then we're going to be talking about Wi-Fi setup before we wrap this up. The deep menu can be accessed with the bottom right hand button right here, menu. And I don't have enough time to go through everything but I am going to show you the most important things that you need to know. It's kind of like a quick crash course on the deep menu. Again, on the full crash course, I go through pretty much everything. And the truth of the matter is, you're only going to use about 20% of the things that you use in here. The other 80% very rarely. On the top, we have our red tab. And remember, if you don't see this screen, come here and go to the menu display and pick standard. I'm not a fan of the guided stuff. So red tab is for shooting. Blue is for playback. Yellow are the camera settings. And the screen tab in the back is the my menu. So what you're going to notice is that every tab has different pages and that's what these numbers are. So we have pages one through eight for shooting and we have multiple for play and so on and so forth. 
In the first red tab, the most important things in here are your image quality. You can change that as we demonstrated from our Q menu. It's going to allow us to choose between RAW and JPEG. And we can see the resolution change as we pick smaller file sizes. If you're a pure beginner, stay on smooth JPEG. If you're shooting something with mixed lighting conditions and you're comfortable learning processing, shoot in RAW. You're also going to see it's going to allow us to use both at the same time. Pretty important setting, I would say. Aspect ratio, keep it on three by two for now. We have our review time, lens aberration correction, allows the camera to fix certain mistakes. And you can see that we have all these different options in here. Notice it, it sees the lens we're using. We can fix distortion, come in here and enable that as well. And essentially what this is doing is it's applying a digital filter or correction to the images that we take according to the lens we're using. I think it's a good idea because it's gonna make your images look better. We have our flash control come in here. Look at all the different settings we have, even for the little flash that we have. And this is a lot of information. We have our external flash. We'll cover that on the full crash course. Drive mode, what the camera does after you push a shutter button down all the way. We already saw this on the quick menu. And let's go to single. This is a different place you can choose it. If you don't like navigating with a touch, which I do, I think it's amazing, you just gotta get it right. You can also use your directional pad if you wanna be a little bit more precise. Exposure compensation, I've seen this before, we can touch on the monitor, we can push left and right. What is AEB? Auto exposure bracketing allows us to tell the camera to take multiple images and change the exposure between each of those. So if I rotate my primary dial, you're going to see these tick marks break off and what that, this tells us is the camera is now going to take three images, one with a negative two value in terms of exposure, an even value, and then plus two stops of exposure. We can also push to the left and right and shift that bracket around. This is pretty good for shooting HDR images that you're going to stack in Photoshop, probably a little bit more of an advanced technique, but if you use this with a timer, the camera will take all three and you won't have to touch it and there won't be any shake. It's something you should know about at some point if you do any kind of serious landscape shooting and you're trying to capture very bright highlights with very dark shadows. ISO speed settings. We can choose our current ISO and we can also choose the maximum for our auto ISO. Why would you wanna use auto ISO? Well, if you have really aggressive changing lighting conditions and you don't wanna change your ISO all the time, you can just come into, I press the MFN button, and press info and now we're on auto. Not a huge fan of it, but it's there if you're just getting started. We have our ISO speed settings for video, pretty much the same stuff, auto lighting optimizer, highlight tone priority. We talked about metering modes. The metering timer is how long your shutter speed and aperture will be displayed in certain views. Exposure simulation, definitely leave this on. This gives us a preview of what we're shooting in. If you turn this off, or if you're in the flash mode, the camera is just going to change the brightness of the monitor. It's not going to give you a preview. White balance and custom white balance we've covered. White shift and bracketing we, we briefly skimmed over. I'd say stay away with, from it if you're a beginner. Color space you're going to want on sRGB for now. If you shoot you know, something for a magazine and you need Adobe RGB color gamut, you would change this. We have our picture styles we've talked about. Long exposure noise reduction, if you're shooting images over one second, probably a good idea to turn it on. High ISO speed noise reduction, I think this is a standard is a pretty good place to start. It's as you increase your ISO, you're going to get more and more grain. This is going to help reduce some of that. Dust delete data is something I pretty much stay away from. I'm a big believer of cleaning sensors and knowing how to do that. And I will demonstrate that on the crash course. Touch shutter we saw, it allows us to take an image as we touch on the monitor as it focus. Touch and drag auto focus settings essentially means that when we are looking through the viewfinder and we're in the viewfinder is a mirror of what we see on the back monitor. If you were to put your eye in here, you would see this screen. Touch and drag auto focus means that as we are looking through the viewfinder, we can use the back monitor to change the position of our focusing square as we look through the viewfinder. Most cameras have a joystick over here, you know, DSLRs, and, and that's what we're manipulating to change the position of the focusing square. Mirrorless cameras, especially Canons, let us 
touch the monitor while we're looking through the viewfinder. It's very fast. My problem is I'm a left eye shooter. And so my, my nose is right here. And so if I touch with my nose here, I'm constantly hitting it. And so the way to do this is to pull your eye off of it just a little bit. So touch and drag settings. If you turn that on, that will work. You can also use the entire screen or you can just drag it relatively. You can also determine what part of the monitor you want to be active, whether it's just this right side or this left side, the top right, the top or the bottom right. If you know for left eye shooters, bottom right is probably going to be the way to go. But pretty awesome that you can control what part is active or, or not. Very nice. Page six, autofocus stuff we've covered in the autofocusing lesson. Eye detection, it's turned off right now because it doesn't like the, the thing I'm using. So we come back to face detection, it should turn on. There it goes. Continuous autofocus, autofocus mode. We've, we've talked about all these things. These are just different places where you can choose it. Page seven, the most important thing is peaking for manual focus. Image stabilization settings, turn it on. Let's see here, what else we got? We have our movie quality, sound recording, we've talked about. Movie servo, that's that little green dot icon over here that we have on the, on the screen in, in movie mode. The button fo function is asking what you want the button to do in video mode. So if we, if we don't want it to meter, we can have it as a one shot autofocus or we can just have it metering because when we're in a movie mode, we have the video record button. It's asking, what do you want this, your shutter button to do? So if I'm not mistaken, auto slow shutter, if you're in the manual mode, this isn't going to matter. But I think what this applies to is that when you shoot video, see here, from the stills mode, it's going to allow us to adjust, or allow, allow the camera to adjust some of the settings in darker situations. It's basically, you're asking for the, ca the camera for some help. So you can shoot video from your stills mode. And that's gonna happen sometimes. You'll be shooting stills and you want a quick video and you don't wanna flip it over to video mode. But auto slow shutter is aut automatically going to make some adjustments when it's low light. And by the way, we're gonna turn that off. So that's those are the most important things in the red tab, the most critical things. Then we come into the playback. A lot of this stuff is things you're never going to use like photo book setup, the creative filters I'm not a fan of. I never use print. I erase images usually right after I take them. If they're really, really bad and I know it, I'll delete them. Otherwise, I wait until I get it on a computer. You can rotate your image in camera. You can protect them with a key icon. Uh, there's some raw processing. We're gonna skip through most of this stuff. So if you wanted to do some raw processing, from the back of your camera you could. Red eye reduction is good for flash. So if you take a picture and the person's eyes are all red, you turn that on, it's going to fire a pre-flash. You can crop and resize your images in camera, something I don't really do, in camera at least. Rating allows you to put a star rating on an image. And when you import this to Photoshop or Lightroom, those star ratings will be respected. So it, it's something that can speed up your workflow. So you, if you really love this picture, you would come in and you can give it five stars or one or whatever, set that. You can pick a range of images. Here's our first one. And then you can give all of these star ratings if you want to select multiple ones. You can select all the images in the folder or a card. So, and then you'd go through and apply the star rating to all of them. So if that's your thing, I mean, that's the way to do it. Let's see what happens when we come back in. And so they all have, you can see 36 of them have, have the star rating of one. So you applied it to all of them. Let's come back through here. Playback information display is something, yeah, you're gonna want this. We talked about this briefly where we can control what information is being shown with different settings. And you can see a little preview for each of those items. There's a lot of stuff in here. Autofocus point display on playback. I leave this turned off. If it was turned on, you would see a little red square. 
where you were focusing. View from last scene, if I'm not mistaken, that allows us to see the information screen that we last used. So if we were shooting and we pressed info, it should pull up the last information screen we had selected. So already coming into the camera settings. So select folder means that we can have multiple folders on our card and we can choose which one we are adding images to. If you want to create a new folder, you just touch create folder, hit OK, and it's going to give you a new folder. The only time I've ever used this is really when I'm doing multiple shoots throughout a day, like one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. I don't really do a lot of those anymore, but if I wanted to keep those images separate, this would allow me to do so. I leave my file numbering on continuous. That means the file number is going to continue to, continue to go higher and higher with every shot. Auto rotate, this is the option I use. It's going to rotate the images for us. Format card, very important, is that when you put a new card into your camera, you're going to want to format it. If you do this, all images are going to be erased. But at the very, very beginning of using a card in a camera, definitely format them. Cancel those. We'll be talking about Wi-Fi in just a second. GPS, there are some ways to pull global position satellite data from images into the camera. It's asking to do this from your mobile device. So if you turn this on, I say generally do not do this because of the drain on the battery. And the batteries are pretty small already. So let's see what else we got in here. Critical stuff, power saving, brightness, time zone language. Hopefully you're an English speaker if you're watching this. But so many different languages. Most of this stuff's pretty straightforward. See if there's anything different. We'll cover sensor cleaning, resolution, output, HDR. So if you want to record HDR video, you're going to need an HDMI recorder for this. Resolution, HDR output, okay, sensor, beep. If you're not a fan of the beeping, we could turn that off here. No more beeping. Shooting information display, we talked about this a little bit. We can control different types of information that are appearing when we are shooting. So if you wanted to adjust those. Viewfinder info toggle settings, same thing. How information is appearing in the viewfinder. Grid display, blight, and brightness reset. Okay, those are all pretty straightforward. Custom function settings on page five. We have not a lot of them, but ISO expansion. If you want to get more ISO, you would turn this on. You know, it's going to be pretty noisy when you do that, just so you know. Safety shift, never use it. Disable. Release shutter without lens. Sometimes people want to take a picture without the lens on if you're using Adapted lenses that do not communicate. This is where you would turn it on. Retract the lens on power off. Certain lenses will do that. The default is enable. So page five, there's a lot of good stuff in here. And the truth of the matter is we can customize certain buttons. The one button that I, I think we should never customize is the MFN because that gives you direct ISO control. But the way this works is it's telling you different buttons and it's going to allow us to change what they do. So if we did want to change the, the MFN, we'd come in here and see so we get this overview. We can see the white dot selected. And so if we wanted to do something other than ISO, look at all the options we have. So many different options. We can have it be a movie mode, a flash firing, but we're not given a lot of buttons to change and ISO is pretty important. But look at all the different options we can have, right? So if you don't, like it as your ISO button, you can change it. The button that I think, the two buttons that I think that you might want to customize are the exposure lock, where we can turn this into a back button focusing for sports. The way this works is you come in here and you turn it to auto focus, stop metering, hit OK, and then we'd come to our shutter button and turn this to metering only. If you do that, you are going to be set up to use your exposure lock button for focusing. This is referred to as back button focusing. It's far more popular for sports, so you can engage focusing from here and shoot with your shutter button, and it separates the focus from taking the picture. There's a lot of people who love to shoot that way. I'm going to leave it on the basic setup for now, but you can see that you can customize most of the buttons differently. I like the rest the way they're set up. 
So one button that we, we're not using when we're shooting is the garbage can icon. And you notice that the blue playback and the garbage can are also blue. This means that the garbage can setting is for playback. So when we're shooting, what this means is the garbage can icon doesn't do anything right now. So we can come in here. If there was a setting that you wanted to have quick access to, I would recommend the drive mode, which is what the camera does after you push a shutter button down all the way, right? And so if we come out and now we're shooting, here, here are the drive modes just by pushing down. And that's the idea of the customizations. We'll go into a little bit more detail on the course on that. We can clear the settings. We have our copyright information, which allows us to embed our name or the year, the copyright information. We can put in our URL, which is very cool. Certification logo display is showing these symbols. We have our firmware version. So if we needed to update the firmware, we would do that here. It also gives us the software information for the lens. And so certain times Canon is going to come out and say, hey, we have a better software for the lens and there's a way to update it. Coming into the menu displays, we talked about this. The My Menu tab, pretty important. It allows us to add our favorite items. The one that I like to, to add typically is the format one. So that first it wants you to add your own tab. There it is. And we're going to configure this and we're going to select items to register. So the one that I use almost all the time is format. And then um, sometimes I'll put quality there because those are really the two that I, I go to a lot. There it is format card. We're going to say OK. Another one that I really like, let's come back out, come back in, image quality, hit OK. And so what this allows us to do is to add items to this green customizable tab so we don't have to go digging through the whole menu every time we want to find them. They're right there. It's very nice. We can sort them if I wanted format card below image quality, I could do that. Come back out, we can delete them, individual ones, we can delete all of them. We can delete the tab, we can rename the tab. So that's the heart of the matter with my menu. So that is your quick overview of the deep menu system and I hope you enjoyed it. Let's talk about Wi-Fi and connecting to our smartphone. You're going to notice I, I moved some space over here. We have a button on the side of our camera that looks like a little radio signal. And that is your direct Wi-Fi or wireless communication button. If you push that, it takes us straight into the yellow menu. Now, I want to demonstrate how you can find this in the menu. It's on the first page on the bottom, wireless menu, Wi-Fi settings. We can come in here and enable. So that button is a shortcut to get you to the menu section. And it's I like it. I think it's awesome. So, so if you want to access it quickly, there it is. We're going to come in here and we're going to hit enable. The camera is going to say it wants us to create a nickname for this. So I'll just put MM next to it in the case there's other cameras around. So the settings screen will close after saving OK. We want to connect to a smartphone. We're going to register to a device for connection. I'm going to be using an iPhone 10, and I'm, it, it gives this QR code. I'm going to show you how to do it through the Wi-Fi. So essentially at this point, what I've done is I've turned the camera into its own Wi-Fi hub. And I'm going to get my smartphone side by side so you can see this. So in order to control our camera with our smartphone, you're going to need to download the Canon Camera Connect app. None of this is going to work without this app. You should have it on Android as well. I'm going to demonstrate on an iPhone. So download that app before you do this walkthrough. So once we've turned the, the Wi-Fi network on on the camera, we're going to come into our, our settings for Wi-Fi. And we should see the camera on here somewhere. Here it is, M50 Canon. I'm going to hit that one. And it's going to ask for a password, which is given right here on the bottom. This is for my specific camera. I'm not worried about you guys stealing it. It's, you know, unless you're, you're like my friend, you live next door. Probably not going to worry about it and I'm gonna join the network. And then, so once I'm connected, I'm going to open the Canon Connect app. Where's that thing? There it is. Turn on Bluetooth to allow connect to connect to accessories. We're gonna hit okay. So it's looking for the camera. Here it is, Canon M50. Once you hit that, you're going to have to hit okay on the camera and let them talk to each other. They're gonna become friends saying disconnect when you're ready. So we're almost there. 
So, so we're in business now. So when we're talking about Canon's Camera Connect app, once we're in, there are two features in here that I like more than the others. Remote live view shooting and images on camera. Images on camera are going to allow you to view the images that you took that are on the camera on your smartphone. Now you can change the view into grid view. I kind of like having the information here and seeing the date and time and exposure settings. You can filter them in different ways, date range, file types. Very nice if you're trying to navigate. If you want to change the order, you can do that as well. Really pretty awesome. So one thing I want to point out is that when you come up here to save image size, we're telling the camera to save the images to the phone. Do you want it to be a reduced size? Do you want it to be the original size? Or do you want to select when you're saving? It gives you these options. And so a lot of camera users want the images right away to their smartphone to upload onto Instagram or Facebook. You don't need the full size resolution for that. So you might want to just choose something like reduced. And this only applies to JPEG. So that's very nice. The second thing in here in the setting is to delete location information. And I think by default, that's a good idea because if you import images with data information and you send that image to somebody, there is a way to pull the GPS position out of the images. So I think leaving it on delete is a good idea. So we, we have some of those settings in there. And basically this is how we can view it. Come in and view the image. You can give it a, you can check it, look at your information here on the bottom. You can give it a star rating that would be respected in Photoshop or Lightroom. You can download the image. Now it's downloading to my smartphone. So if you just wanted to download individual images, that's how you would do it. You could send it to your printer. If you wanted to, you could delete it. Obviously pretty straightforward in terms of navigating images. So the cool part of this is the remote live view shooting. So you're going to notice that we go into this live view, we are going to be able to control certain aspects of the camera from the smartphone. It's very nice. You're going to notice that we have a stills and a video icon at the top. So whichever one is selected is the mode we're in. You can see it's changing over here. And for vloggers, this is kind of nice because it gives you a remote that you can start and stop video recording. We get our audio levels. We get the time recording here. We have camera settings that we can come in, touch auto focus. We can do live view magnification with a double tap. We can get a mirror live view display. There's a lot of very nice, cool things. We can rotate it. It's one of the better apps that I've seen in terms of video recording. We want to focus. And I, I tested, I was testing this the other day. It was a little finicky. Let's see if it'll, it'll it keeps me locked out. Yeah. So some of the other settings here are on the bottom. We have our white balance. We have the focusing mode that we want to use. It's looking for a face detection. So we can go come over here and you're going to notice that when I double tap, it, it jumps in. Single tap should change the focusing position. We can change our resolution. We have microphone settings. Seriously, it's awesome. This is a great little app for video feature if we want to turn the servo focus on or off. So there's a lot of really, really great options in terms of the settings for video. Coming into the stills option, same thing, single tap, should move the focusing square. You can see it's engaging focus. We've got a green focus lock there. If not, you can press the auto focus side button here. Slide over to take the picture. So push to auto focus, slide to take the picture. If we come into our settings, we have our shutter speed we can change remotely. It's very nice. ISO. We have our white balance control and our focusing cluster and then our drive type. So if you wanted to do a timer, a 10 second timer, really great. It's awesome. It's wonderful. Let me see, we can view the images that we just took. It would be fun to come in here and play around on it. We can show the auto focus button. I would definitely recommend leaving that on. You can perform bulb shooting with a long tap. Depends on the camera. It's not going to let us do it. So we don't have to worry about that. And then when we come back out to this main menu, we have some other types of information that we can change if we wanted to. Let's see where it is here. Yeah, we can change the name of the camera. We can reset certain display. Let's see here. 
It has this little guide if you need help connecting. Auto transfer. So if you want the camera to start downloading images as soon as you take them, you would turn this on. We have the reduce image size and the delete information. We saw that in the other menu. But if you're out shooting and you want these images ready to go for social media, you can just turn on auto transfer. It's gonna to download to your smartphone. The location information is, I have mixed feelings about it simply because this is going to embed GPS data from your smartphone into the images. There are certain people who want this. If you do a lot of hiking, I do disaster aid work, so it's kind of cool to tag things. Uh, I don't recommend it with this camera for battery reasons, is that when you connect your smartphone to your camera and there's this extra feature running in the background, uh, sometimes your battery life will reduce dramatically. There are some cameras that have built-in GPS that just drains the battery like crazy. So the truth of the matter is I don't use the location information that much. So, and especially for security reasons, especially if you're, you know, don't want to give your information out by pictures, probably a good idea to leave it off. So that is a quick overview of connecting your smartphone by Wi-Fi to your camera, shooting in live remote for both stills and video, and we can also view images and have them automatically download. So when we're talking about lenses available for our M50, it's important to remember that this is referred to as an EFM mount. There are EFS mounts, which is designed for APS-C cameras. And there's also regular EF mounts. The EFS mounts and the EF mounts will work on our EFM mount if we have an appropriate adapter. This is a Canon EF to EFM mount. They go for about $180. They are expensive, but if you have Canon lenses already, it's a no-brainer. There's a knockoff version made by Photodiox. It runs about $40. It doesn't work as well from the reviews that I'm reading. And I have a large amount of Canon lenses. So for me, this makes sense. And there is one Canon lens that I would definitely recommend taking a look at if you go the adapted route, and that is the 50 millimeter 1.8. It's a great lens because it's a wide aperture. It's great for portraits, low light shooting, really a wonderful lens. And there's a company called Yunguno that makes a knockoff version for less than $50. When we're talking about native lenses specifically for the M50, there's a handful of them you should take a look at. Any kind of vlogging, any kind of walk around hand holding, you're going to want the 11 to 22. It's a wide angle lens, very versatile for video recording. I have the 15 to 45. This came as part of the kit bundle that I bought, but I've seen these for about 300 or 250 if you were to buy them separately. If you're going to be doing any kind of telephoto work, I would recommend starting with the 18 to 150 telephoto. That's a $500 lens. But the thing that's great about the EFM lenses is, is that they're so small. And so, you know, if, you, if you're coming from a, a background of full frame lenses like me, they get very heavy. So just with a couple lenses, they weigh almost nothing. If you're on a long trip traveling, it makes a lot of sense. There is also a 28 millimeter macro that has LED lights built into the lens. It's a really interesting lens. That one runs about 250 to $300, depending on where you get it. After you have the right lenses, you're definitely going to want to look at some kind of support. Talking about tripods, I am not a fan of the flimsy little tripods you get at Walmart, and the reason is with any amount of use, they are going to break eventually. Obviously, they're better than nothing, but I would recommend taking a look at the Bogan Manfrotto B Free or the Mi Photo tripod with a locking ball head. And by the way, I have links on my blog, on my gear page, that will show you where all this stuff is, and you can find everything that I'm talking about with direct links. Those are our affiliate links. It supports what I'm doing. But the tripod is important because if you're doing anything long exposure for landscape or you're doing timer shots, painting with light, there's a lot of times video work. You're going to need a really good tripod. If you go onto eBay, you can find some of these used for well less than $100. I also think a smaller tripod makes sense for the case of the M50. It's pretty light. And Joby Gorilla Pod makes these handheld flexible tripods that make a lot of sense. You know, you can set it up on your desk. Speaking of video, if you are serious about doing vlogging work or high-end video recording, you're definitely going to need an external microphone. Rode makes a number of onboard microphones that fit into your hot shoe on top of the camera. 
And when we're talking about flash systems, there are so many Canon flash units, but the one that I recommend is a Godox TT685C, stands for Canon. Those run just over $100 for any kind of flash work. I think that's your best value for portraits. There's a lot of power. It's really a knockoff version of the flagship EXRT600 version 2, which is without a discount, it's almost $600. So talking about tremendous savings, that's the flash unit that I cover on the crash course. Again, the most valuable tool that you have for your photography is your brain and how you think about the problem solving you'll go into. And so I think out of all those accessories, the most important one is my crash course on the Canon M50. That link is in the description below. In any event, I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial and I hope I've earned your subscription. Again, I publish videos several times a week. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the crash course.